If you've ever fallen asleep with your arms overhead and your hands go numb, you're gonna wanna watch this video. Good morning. Happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. Dr. Mike, nice batch. Okay, so we had a pretty decent weekend. Um, looking forward to a great week this week as usual. And I got a great Q&A to start off um, the week. And this comes from Zach with a CH. And Zach says, thank you for all the time you're putting in to answer these questions. You're welcome, Zach. I was hoping that you could speak of the potential causes of thoracic outlet syndrome as it pertains to your model. When thinking about how it was taught in school, I think about the different sites of compression, and he mentioned scalenes, costoclavicular, and pecs, um, but would be curious to hear about some of the underlying mechanisms you feel are responsible for symptoms and subsequent treatment strategies. Thank you so much. Zach, this is a great question because it, it applies to a lot of people. So thoracic outlet syndrome symptoms, um, typically pain, numbness in your arm, some neck stuff, you're gonna have some, some tissue sensitivity in, in the pec or, or, or neck region. But a lot of folks have a really mild um, presentation of this, especially at nighttime, you'll notice it. For those of you that like to sleep with your arms overhead and your arms go numb, this is sort of a, a, a mild variation of this. And so um, for those of you who feel that, this might come in handy. Um, you mentioned the three big sites. So, so we talk about uh, pec minor is a big one. The costoclavicular space is a big one. And then the scalene triangle are, are all big ones. Um, if, you, if you look for references in regards to uh, behavior of the nervous system, you want to look at, uh, it's at Berg, um, Butler, and Shacklock. And so those are the guys that are going to talk about the, the movement of the nervous system. And in each case, what you'll find is, is that the nerves like three things. They like space, they like movement, they like blood flow. And thoracic outlet or, or pec minor syndrome or whatever they're gonna, they're gonna call this thing immediately takes away all three. So we lose our space, we lose movement, and we lose blood flow. Because you've got that neurovascular sleeve that, that tracks out of, the, out of the neck, underneath the clavicle, in front of the rib, and under the pec minor down into the arm. And so if we have any form of compressive strategy under those circumstances, we're probably gonna get some variation on the theme of any of those symptoms. But if we look at this from a, a progressive nature, so if we talk about symptoms at, at pec minor, under those circumstances, typically what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a down pump handle under those circumstances. And, and so what we're gonna lose here from a measurement standpoint is our traditional measures of shoulder internal rotation, which you would measure at, at uh, 90 degrees of, of uh, traditional abduction. Um, if we go farther up, if, if the compression strategy is moving upward and we're gonna get a, a manubrium that gets pulled down, this is where we're gonna see symptoms at the costoclavicular space. And what we're gonna lose here is we're gonna lose internal rotation behind the back. So your old, old school aptly scratch test where you reach behind your back, try to touch the opposite shoulder blade, you're gonna lose internal rotation there. As we move up, the, the sequence of events in regards to compressive strategies. If we get compressed in the upper dorsal rostral space, this is where we're gonna to start to see, see the issues in the, the scalene triangle. So we're gonna lose lower cervical rotation under these circumstances um, to the affected side. Um, you're gonna get some, some pain with rotation away from the affected side as well. You might get cervicogenic headaches, um, you're typically gonna have some, some symptoms that are well above the clavicle under those circumstances. So again, your traditional tests are gonna be cervical rotation, um, as well as the traditional abduction external rotation test, which looks like that, that, that doorway stretch, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But, but what we may not lose, and, and this is kind of an important thing to pay attention to, is we may not lose our early uh, flexion range of motion uh, because we may not be looking at end game strategies because what we, what we probably see under these circumstances more often than not is anything that's dorsal, rostral, or sternal and above being the primary uh, influences in, in regards to the, to the compression. Now, let's talk about traditional strategy first. Um, under many circumstances, so that the stretch and strengthen uh, model that, that many will default to for some unknown reason um, may actually work uh, occasionally, but it's kind of iffy. And it, I think it's even iffy in the research when you, when you look at it. So you'll look at something like the traditional pec doorway stretch, like I mentioned just a minute ago. 
um, under those circumstances, you're trying to, to influence a concentrically oriented muscle by yanking on it. So you might get a yielding strategy out of that and get some, maybe some temporary symptomatic relief if you can, if you can hit a breath under the right circumstances. So if I had like a down pump handle, but I don't have dorsal rostral compression yet, that position actually might bring the pump handle up if I take a breath at the right time, and then I actually do favorably influence symptoms. But if I have dorsal rostral compression at the same time, then um, it's gonna be an exercise in futility. This is also a situation where I wouldn't wanna use like, like the traditional lower trapezius strengthening or scapular muscle strengthening because all I'm doing is reinforcing the compressive strategy A to P, and I'm really not gonna impact symptoms. In fact, you're probably gonna produce symptoms during the treatment in, in and of itself. So what we really wanna do here, uh, Zach, is we wanna to start to create expansion um, from, from the bottom up. So the lungs fill from the bottom up, so let's think along those lines as far as strategy is concerned. How we're gonna approach this from narrows to wides is not a whole lot different. It's just gonna be where we, we're, gonna, we're gonna start our influence. So if I'm talking about a wide ISA, I'm gonna start with dorsal rostral expansion as my primary, primary target. And under these circumstances, we've got any number of activities that we're going to utilize to try to expand that, that dorsal rostral space. Um, because of, of where we're trying to influence this, because of the influence of, of shoulder girdle position, I'm going to stay below that 90 degree level of, of sh traditional shoulder flexion to start so I can drive the expansion posteriorly and then again work my way up. Um, if I'm progressing a wide after the dorsal rostral expansion, now I'm going to go after pump handle. But with, with the narrows, I'm probably going to start with these pump handle activities. So now I am moving the shoulder towards that 90 degrees of flexion. So I've got quadruped activities that, that I could start with. Um, my, my arm bar progressions, I can also start with. The cool thing about the arm bar progressions is that I can probably start to superimpose some of the neck range of motion on top of that as long as I'm not reproducing symptoms under those circumstances. Now, if I have, if I have limitations that are below the clavicle, then I may not need to go any farther, and this might, might be my solution. However, if I start to see symptoms above where I'm, I am getting the, the neck pain, the, the headaches that are associated with this, now I definitely have to go after my upper dorsal rostral expansion because I need end range shoulder flexion and I need lower cervical rotation to, to the affected side. So under these circumstances, what we would look at when I have this upper DR compression is I have a scenario where I cannot get into an early propulsive strategy. And so that's what these activities are gonna be driven towards. So again, I can start to use my arm bar progressions with, with cervical rotation. If you're a kettlebell get up guy, um, go do the get up to elbow and then drive the shoulder rotation and, and cervical rotation simultaneously, just like you do with, with the arm bar, superimpose some breathing on top of that and you get a nice big bang exercise, just an FYI. But I, what I wanna do is I wanna start to work the, the shoulder from that 90 degrees and above range. So I'm gonna start doing my walkouts from my knees. If I can get to an inverted um, activity, like an inverted lazy bear, then, then I'm gonna go there. Ultimately, what I wanna be able to do is I wanna hit that end range flexion um, with, without symptoms. So I might end up using like a cable activity like you can see on screen right now. But the thing that I gotta wanna make sure of, especially with my wide ISA, is just that I can close that ISA with that overhead reach. So, so to get expansion all the way up on a wide ISA, the ISA has to be able to close. Also keep in mind, the idiosyncratic movement strategies associated with the YS, wide ISA typically do not have end range flexion included there. So be very, very careful with that. Now. Some counterintuitive stuff, which is always kind of fun to play with because there's always challenges with, with your patients and you may not be able to drive the upper extremities the, the way you want to without creating symptoms. So now we're gonna use some iterative structures to our advantage here. So if I put you in a prone propulsive position, what I'm doing is I'm creating an early propulsive strategy in, in the, um, the lower uh, axial skeleton. So, so I'm, I'm turning the sacrum, I'm turning the lumbar spine, which is analogous to my, my upper dorsal in lower cervical. And so I actually may be able to drive expansion that way to start to create the early propulsive strategies through the axial skeleton. My offset heels, elevated um, squatting activities will also produce a similar effect. So, so keep those on the table. Don't forget about, about how we can influence this, especially when you're, when you're really jammed up and you can't seem to drive symptoms or if somebody is too symptomatic in the affected area. 
Um, one of my, my favorite totally counterintuitive kind of things is using this curl and press activity. The thing you want to make sure of is that you're doing the curl and the press on the asymptomatic side because what I'm actually doing is I'm pressing that dumbbell overhead and turning my head away is I'm comp intentionally creating a compressive strategy in the, in the upper dorsal and lower cervical region on the pressing side, but I, and in return, I get expansion and I get rotation to the opposite side. So that's gonna actually help alleviate some of the symptoms above the, the, the clavicle. So this would be much like, if you go back to the reverse hyper uh, video that we did a little while back, how we used the single leg reverse hyper to create some of the turning through the sacrum. We're doing the exact same thing in the dorsal rostral and lower cervical um, space there. So um, Zach, great question. I think it's gonna help a lot of people. Truly appreciate you. Um, if you've got any other questions, go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.